Hello, and welcome to our series, Conversations on Zionism, Reclaiming the Narrative. I'm Russell Robinson, Chief Executive Officer of Jewish National Fund USA. The time has come to be the voice of what Zionism really is. We're exposing the beautiful and diverse facets and facts of Zionism. Join me on this journey, together with Conversations on Zionism, Reclaiming the Narrative, this is Zionism. My guest today is Dr. Raphael Medoff, founding director of the David S. Wyman Institute. He is the author of more than 20 books about the Holocaust, Zionism, and American Jewish history, and is a member of the Committee of Ethics in Jewish Leadership, which promotes the values of democracy, accountability, and transparency in the American Jewish organizations. Please welcome Dr. Raphael Medoff. Raphael, welcome to ZTV, to our Zionist studios and our conversation on Zionism. Uh, thank you for agreeing to be on our show today. Hi, Russell. Thanks very much for inviting me. So I, I have to tell you, I, I'm so fascinated with the conversation that we're going to have because you are an American historian on Jewish American history is uh, uh, what I'm going to focus on. And, and I'm going to jump right in. You know, when I read that, like in 1722, they were teaching Hebrew in Harvard, uh, and you've written about America and Zionism and, and how it relates to the American Jewish community and our, our entire uh, Zionist connection. So I'm going to take you back a little bit because I want you to tell our audience something about uh, Chaim Solomon and the Revolutionary War and, and Jews and, and involvement in the American uh, democracy? Well, sometimes we forget that the uh, settlers who established the American colonies uh, and, then, and then later fought um, the American Revolution with, with Jews uh, as a part of that fight um, were Christians and they were believing Christians, Bible-believing, devout Christians, um, many of whom came to America's shores in the beginning precisely because they wanted to be able to freely practice their religion. And the reason that's important in terms of American Jewish history and especially American Zionist history is that it means that America's founding fathers and mothers had a deep personal connection to what the Bible says, including what it says about the Jewish rights to the land of Israel. And that's the reason why in almost every state, 49 out of 50, you can find numerous towns that, are, that have names that are taken straight from the Bible. In almost every state, you'll find a Bethlehem, a Hebron, a, a, um, a, a Zion, a, um, and other similar biblical names, because um, America's founders saw um, the Holy Land as a special place, and they recognized the, the deep and ancient and unbreakable connection between the Jewish people and the Holy Land. That's very important for understanding why, to this day, there's such widespread sympathy among American Christians for Zionism and for Israel. Well, you know, I find that fascinating because I'm gonna use Haim Solomon, and if you could tell a little more story, here's a Jew, said he was a Jew, it was uh, uh, no hidden yet in there, uh, helped finance the Revolutionary War, and I, I deal because in today's world, people are talking about, should I wear my Mogan David outside? Should I wear my yarmulke? But during the Revolutionary War, Chaim Solomon said, I'm a Jew, but he came forward. Of course, there was a very small Jewish community uh, back during the Revolutionary period. But Chaim Solomon and others did play an active role in fighting for um, America's freedom. The Jewish community grew substantially, of course, during the 1800s, during the next century, when large numbers of immigrants began coming over, first from Germany and elsewhere in Central Europe in the mid-1800s, and then, of course, in even larger numbers from Russia and e other East European areas in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And so ultimately, the American Jewish community um, was born of these two great streams of immigration. 
And then we started having the, the, Zion, the, the modern Zionist movement come, and we had the militant, uh, 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 what you uh, referred to, and people refer to the militant Zionist movement of Jabotinsky. Uh, it's before the establishment of the State of Israel. Tell us the story of Zionism in America in that time period. The Jewish immigrants who came uh, from Europe to the United States made a choice. They chose to go to America, not to Palestine. But that was not a rejection of the early Zionist movement of the late 1800s. Um, at, at that time, Palestine under Turkish rule was an extremely undeveloped, um, extremely difficult place to live. So it's not surprising um, that, that the bulk of Jews who were fleeing from pogroms and discrimination in Europe chose to come to the United States where the doors were open. Um, and not to go to the land of Israel, where the Turk, Turkish rule made it extremely difficult to enter and to live there. So it's important to remember that, that from um, the late 1800s on, a, a very large portion, large majority of American Jews were very sympathetic to the idea of a Jewish return to the land of Israel and, and the ultimate establishment of a Jewish state, even though they weren't personally making their lives there. So it's so interesting because here you have a, a nation of Israel, uh, the Jewish nation, 2,000 years, we haven't had it. You have people who have immigrated to, quote, the land of freedom, the United States. You now have in the 1800s uh, um, uh, this uh, beginning of the second Zionist movement, the modern Zionist movement happening. And you have the Jabotinsky's. You have uh, a lot of people that have never they look at 2,000 years and, and, and haven't had the opportunities to have, um, you know, online or see uh, internet or even maps or so on. But they were really active in our Jewish community for Israel, weren't they? Yes. And the American Zionist movement grew quickly and very significantly starting after World War I. Uh, there were several obvious reasons. First, once um, the British issued the Balfour Declaration, pledging to establish a Jewish national home in Palestine, the whole idea of creating a Jewish state, which might have seemed radical to some before that, gained an important new international legitimacy. Second, America's president, Woodrow Wilson, endorsed that goal of a Jewish state. And equally important, the early American Zionist movement was led by uh, a Supreme Court Justice, Louis Brandeis. And, and, and Brandeis's involvement um, gave the movement a great deal of credibility. So when you begin with a, a large community of immigrants who already in their hearts um, had a strong affection for the idea of a Jewish return to Zion and who prayed every day in the, in the Jewish liturgy for, a, um, for the Jews to return to the land of Israel, now had the uh, blessing for that endeavor from the President of the United States and from other, other leading figures, and importantly, um, the Balfour Declaration was endorsed by the entire United States Congress in a very important early bipartisan endorsement of the goal of Jewish statehood. So American Zionism uh, during the 1920s was a, was, became a very widespread force in the Jewish community. After the rise of Hitler in 1933, then the entire Zionist movement and the goal of a Jewish state took on a very new and dramatic urgency because, because once Jews in Germany and then elsewhere in Europe were being actively persecuted, the need for a Jewish state became something that was immediate uh, and, and, and urgent. So in your writings, 
you know, you talk about a monumental moment in 1944 before the state of Israel. What was that? Until 1944, America's major political parties had never officially embraced the idea of Zionism, of creating a Jewish state in Palestine. The individual leaders of both parties had made uh, sympathetic statements and individual presidents uh, had expressed sympathy for the idea of a Jewish state. But in 1944, for the first time, both the Republican Party first and then followed by the Democratic Party uh, in their presidential platforms, in their party platforms in the 1944 race, both of them officially on the record endorsed Zionism. And that was very important for, um, for making Zionism a, a, a permanent part of the American political culture. Since 1944, every, every four years, both parties have again reaffirmed their support now for the state of Israel. It began in 1944, um, as you might expect, as a kind of a, um, a contest for Jewish votes. But it was also an expression of principle of, of, of genuine heartfelt uh, sympathy for the Jew, Jewish refugees in Europe and for the justice and importance of the Jews being able to go back to their ancient land and recreate their Jewish state. So the combination of politics and genuine Christian and humanitarian sympathy for Zionism combined to result in that landmark event of both political parties formally supporting Zionism and the goal of a Jewish state. You know, but I want to frame that for especially younger uh, viewers uh, of this. We were a very small group of voters even then. We are now, we were then, but we were vocal and, and yet we stood up. I mean, people who, again, 2000 years didn't have, you know, a nation. Uh, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have social media for the younger people. Believe it or not, there was no social media. And people stood up and, and said, count on me. And, and you talked in, in, in a writing about Ben Hecht and the Hollywood. And, you know, we all sort of say Hollywood today uh, doesn't always come to the uh, defense of Israel and, and positive Israel. But what happened with Ben Hecht and Hollywood during that time? Hecht was the most prominent Hollywood screenwriter, scriptwriter in the 1930s and 1940s. And the story of Heck's transformation was um, in many ways um, an example of an important change that took place among many American Jews during those days. Heck uh, grew up in what we might call an assimilated environment. He was not a, a, a active in the Jewish community and was not a practitioner of Jewish religious rituals. But the rise of Hitler and, and Nazi anti-Semitism in the 1930s cause him to do an about face. And suddenly in 1939, 1940, Hecht emerged as one of the most prolific and outstanding uh, public exponents of the need for rescuing Jews from the Holocaust and creating a Jewish state. He was a, a newspaper columnist, as well as a, a, a screenwriter uh, and a writer of plays and a novelist. So he, his voice was very important um, in America's literary circles. In, in during that period. And as a Jew who had never really identified with Jewish causes, um, he spoke from the heart about what he saw in the world around him. He saw, he saw the Jewish people facing an unprecedented crisis. And he recognized, even though he had no formal Jewish education or, or Jewish upbringing, but he recognized from somewhere deep in his heart and his soul that the Jewish people needed to have a state again and that was ultimately the only way to guarantee Jewish survival. Now, he did it. He wrote a play. And he, in, in that time of the world, the social media, and I'm going to keep using, utilizing you know, all the, the, the methodologies that we have today, they didn't have then. So he had to sort of um, promote this movement, but he promoted it by writing a play, by taking it on the road. Tell us something about it. A very sad phenomenon of those period of that period was that many major newspapers, including the New York Times, uh, frequently put news about the plight of Jewish refugees uh, in their back pages or didn't cover it at all. So those who cared about the refugee crisis and wanted to help promote the idea of a Jewish state had to take out paid advertisements in major American newspapers. Hecht was part of a, a small activist group. Today, we would call it a, a political action committee 
which was known as the Bergson Group. During the 1940s, they placed more than 200 full-page newspaper ads in major American daily newspapers around the country to um, urge the Roosevelt administration to do something to save the Jews and to push for the idea of recreating the ancient Jewish state in Palestine. Hecht wrote many of those ads, and his dramatic, hard-hitting messages frequently caught the attention of uh, American policymakers, of the White House, uh, and, and helped arouse the Jewish community. Many American Jews in those days were, uh, as, the, as immigrants or as children of immigrants, were not fully comfortable with their place in American society. They were not, did not feel entirely comfortable speaking out about Jewish concerns. But Ben Hecht's powerful writings helped inspire many American Jews to join the protests that the Bergson Group organized. So it's fascinating. They stood up, and again, it's a, a new Jew. I mean, you're you're here. You have the the accent. You're not necessarily a hundred percent accepted, quote, as an American yet. You're trying to find your way, and yet they stood up and and placed these ads. And again, that was the methodology to getting the message out. They came up with a play, and and they you you talk about it in one of your books about how they tried to merge the American Revolution experience and the Zionist. Uh, movement together. The Bergson Group was ahead of its time in what we would today call its messaging. When they, uh, immediately after World War II, began very actively pushing for the establishment of a Jewish state, they understood that Americans needed to hear about this cause in terms that were familiar. It wasn't enough to just speak about um, about, let's say, Jewish ancient rites or the Jewish biblical connection, although that was important. But very often in Ben Hecht's uh, newspaper ads and, and, other, um, and uh, other literary um, avenues, he drew analogies between the American Revolution and the Jewish Revolution in Palestine, both of which were against the British. And he argued that, um, that the, the Jews fighting in, um, in Palestine the Haganah, the Irgun, the Stern Group, um, were in a sense um, uh, analogous to the, um, to the Americans who fought against the British for the freedom of the United States of America during the revolutionary period. This was a very effective type of argument because it, it showed ordinary Americans that there were genuine parallels between the justice of their own struggle for freedom and the freedom that Jews were fighting for in the land of Israel. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back and just relate it to a second for our audience, you know, to go from Haim Solomon uh, helping to finance the Revolutionary War on the, for the Americans to having Hecht, who's uh, uh, tying it now all together to that great fight for independence from America to the Zionist movement. But I also want you to talk to, the, uh, to our audience about how Zionism helped fight segregationism. Well, it's an interesting story, uh, at which Ben Hecht was um, in the middle of. It took place in early 1947. Hecht created a Broadway play called A Flag is Born, uh, which, which ran for 10 very successful weeks on Broadway in, the, in late 1946 and, and into early 1947. And then the play was taken on the road to other cities. Incidentally, one of its stars was a very young Marlon Brando, just before uh, he became an internationally famous uh, star of, of the screen. When the when the flag is born was taken to a number of other cities to to be staged there, the Bergson Group ran into a uh, a problem 
with their planned performance in Washington, D.C. The problem was that uh, the theater that originally wanted to stage the play was a segregated theater. In fact, they did not allow African-Americans in the theater at all. Hecht himself um, was an outspoken uh, opponent of racism, and he and um, dozens of other leading American playwrights uh, had issued a pu public proclamation uh, preventing the staging of any of their plays in theaters that discriminated against blacks. So the uh, planned performance in Washington had to be moved up to Baltimore at the very last moment in uh, February 1947. But in Baltimore, they ran into another obstacle. It turned out that the, the, the theater there, where it was going to be staged, did allow African Americans, but restricted them to seats high up in the balcony. The Bergson Group then teamed up with the local Baltimore chapter of the NAACP to pressure the theater management to allow, um, allow the Bergson Group to act as the official um, management of the theater for that night uh, in order to break down this policy of segregation. So the performance of A Flag is Born in February 1947, and coincidentally, it was on Lincoln's birthday, uh, was the first time in modern history that a major theater in Baltimore allowed uh, African Americans to see without any discrimination. The NAACP was then able to use that precedent to desegregate, to bring about the desegregation of other theaters in Baltimore. What began as a strictly Jewish and Zionist play ended up intersecting with, a, um, with an equally just cause, the fight for black civil rights here in America. So Raphael, isn't that interesting? And I hope our audience uh, uh, really reads your books and your writings uh, and goes online because Zionism so often is portrayed today. We talk about it on this show about it's been stolen from us. You know, uh, we talk about Zionism and racism. Here's a case of not only Zionism, and I'll get you to define it and to talk about the dictionary of Zionist terms and what it means, not only not, not racism, it fought racism. So the Zionist movement in America was part of fighting uh, uh, the racist uh, uh, movement uh, of, uh, in America as well. It's interesting how um, amidst all of our uh, heated contemporary debates about Israel and Zionism, sometimes we forget even such relatively recent history. In the 1940s, not only was um, in this particular episode, was uh, was the Zionist cause helpful to the black civil rights movements. But in general, during that period, and not just in the 1940s, but also later, um, it was uh, the forces on the liberal side of the political spectrum that were the most strongly pro-Zionist and pro-Israel. They weren't the only ones. But the point is today, people in the progressive camp who think that somehow their views um, on other issues uh, require them to also be hostile to Israel, are forgetting the, the history of their own political camp, which, um, which as recently as the 40s and 50s and 60s, was in fact very supportive of Zionism and of Israel. So help us today define Zionism and what are some of your thoughts about the conversation and where we should be taking it and how we should be making it happen? The definition of Zionism really has never changed from its beginning, going back to Theodore Herzl and the first Zionist Congress in the early years of the Zionist movement, all the way through the establishment of the State of Israel. And now here we are um, more than 70 years later. And it has always been essentially the same thing, the legitimate struggle of the Jewish people to reestablish their sovereign state in their ancient homeland. Now, the, um, the immediate goal of Zionism was, in a sense, accomplished in 1948. But of course, Israel is a growing, thriving, um, developing, progressing country. And, um, and so American Jewish support for Israel, we call American Zionism, remains just as important, just as needed today as it was in those days. I'm Zoe, and I'm from Dream Israel, an incredible teen travel initiative at Jewish National Fund USA. Let me tell you what Dream Israel is. Through this initiative, any high school student can receive a grant of up to $7,500 to put towards their study abroad program in Israel with one of Jewish National Fund USA's academic partners. How do you earn this grant? 
All you need to do is fundraise for a Jewish National Fund USA philanthropic project in Israel. Without this Dream Israel grant, I would not be able to be here in Israel. Thank you, Dream Israel. Thank you, Dream Israel. Thank you, Dream Israel, for making my dreams come true. Take the trip of your dreams with Dream Israel and Jewish National Fund USA. So, Raphael, uh, do you believe that the Zionist movement, the establishment of the state of Israel, strengthens American Jewry as well as American Jewry strengthening the Zionist movement in Israel? Absolutely. There's no question that Zionism and Israel play a very central and important role in the identity of most American Jews. Of course, there are small groups um, within the Jewish community today, as there have always been, who are um, unfriendly or unsympathetic to Zionism in Israel. But for the vast majority of Jews um, today, as in previous, previous uh, generations throughout the past century, um, the idea of a Jewish state and the reality of a Jewish state plays a very important uh, inspiring role in our lives. And not just inspiring, because uh, of course, a very significant number of American Jews have spent time in Israel, not just as tourists, but as students. And a certain number of American Jews have made their homes in Israel. Israel is in every sense um, a central part of American Jewish culture and uh, is, is deeply important in the lives of, of the vast majority of American Jews. And it strengthens us. Um, uh, you know, so many of your uh, writings, and again, I'm going to tell our audience to, to please uh, uh, get your books and get your writings. So you talk about, you know, A to Z Zionism. We talk about the, the definitions. Uh, and you bring it to, to a point where it even, I, I don't want to say simplifies it, but it brings it to a very focused point. So tell our, especially younger people, why today is it important to stand up as we've been standing up since the beginning of this nation, the United States, standing up for Zionism, standing up as, as Jews. Why is it important to do it today? Because ultimately, Israel's cause is a just cause. In fact, there's no cause that is more just. Israel stands for um, moral principles and ideas that are timeless and that are important to us as Jews um, and as Americans. The, um, the, the actions of Israel in terms of, it, of, the, of the scientific and cultural achievements which Israel has shared with, um, with America and the world are something to be very proud of. Um, beyond that, of course, Israel's uh, extraordinary leadership role in, um, in fighting the, the battle against terrorism and in, um, and in standing as a bulwark of American uh, democratic and cultural values uh, in, in that part of the world is also something that's extremely important. What do we need to do more as an organized Jewish community in organizations or outside of organizations? What is a, a formula that you want to give us uh, to, to move forward and, and keep taking that that we should have had from our past, remember it, and moving forward. There are so many areas in which American Jews can continue to play a vital role in helping and supporting Israel, whether it's from you know, making donations to, uh, to Israel and to, and to groups that help Israel, to visiting Israel um, and, and playing a more active role, to encouraging our children and grandchildren to study there, um, and, and of course, to speaking out for Israel on America's college campuses, on um, America's op-ed pages, on radio shows, in writing letters to newspapers and to elected officials. On every level, political, cultural, educational, American Jews have a vital role to play, to continue to play um, in strengthening the relationship between America and Israel and between the Jewish community and the Jewish state. So, Raphael, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for inspiring us and, and educating us. And, you know, i just going to tell everybody, read Raphael. He's always printing. He's always writing, uh, blogging, putting it out there. You will learn an, um, just a tremendous amount. I want to thank you. Uh, I will keep reading. I'll keep listening. I'll keep learning from you. And uh, looking forward to working on the the pathway of bringing Zionism is a positive word back to the world. Thank you so much for having me on your show. It's been my pleasure. 
To watch this and all of our past episodes, go to ZTV, our Zionism Studios YouTube page, and subscribe to get notifications.